Avui, després de molt de temps, reprenem les xerrades aquestes del divendres aquí de manera presencial. Certament també estan... les passarem en YouTube, però crec que és una oportunitat molt bona de poder quedar i veure'ns les cares aquí un cop a la setmana. Les xerrades en anglès presentarem en anglès l'espíquer d'avui. Today we have a talk by Francesco Colizzi. Francesco ha dit ha estudiat a Farmacèutical Chemistry a la Universitat de Bologna, a Itàlia, i ha defensat el PhD en 2009 a la Universitat de Trieste. Després ha fet diversos postdocs a Itàlia i després a Espanya, a Barcelona, on ha arribat a 2016 a la IRB, l'Institut de Recerca en Biomedicina. He has been postdoc there, and until very recently that he got a Ramon y Cajal award, which, as you know, it's a very, very competitive one. And then he had to choose where to go, and he chose the ICM to perform this study. Francesco, his research is about biomolecular simulations, and basically to study and to link the structure, dynamics, and function of the of several molecular systems by by computer simulations. Uh, and I think this is what he will explain to us today. And I think he will try to make a strong link be between uh, his research lines and what he can plan to do it here. So, Francesco, up to you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me right? Yes. Thank you, Ramon, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. Thank you, everybody, also for being here physically, and also those, uh, if any, listening online. Uh, I'm Francesco Colizzi. I just arrived at the ARB, so I prepared a little uh, slide, a timeline, about uh, who I am. Many of you haven't seen you. I haven't seen many of you as well. So let's try to know each other. As Ramon said, I, I, I studied medicine and chemistry at the University of Bologna. I also uh, got my PhD in computational drug discovery at the University of Bologna. Then I moved for a postdoc in computational biophysics of nucleic acid at CISA, the International School for Advanced Studies in Trieste. After that period, I took a two years sabbatical to rejoin uh, my, the, the person who is now the, the, the mother of my son. So we spent two years in Quebec. I had no scientific affiliation for two years. Then we decided to come back to Europe, and I arrived, we arrived both in, uh, in, uh, in Barcelona, in Spain, actually, and, uh, um, and I started a PhD, uh, a postdoc in uh, the ARB Barcelona, ARB Barcelona Institute for Research in Biomedicine. And uh, during this period, I was supported also by a Marie Curie uh, Fellowship, European Marie Curie Fellowship, individual fellowship that allowed me to develop <coughs> tools for drug discovery. Then I continue, continue until I got the Ramon Cajal uh, grant of fellowship, and I move. And since 2021, uh, 1st of April 2021, uh, I am here at, uh, at ICM, uh, where I'm building a biomolecular, what we call biomolecular. Uh, simulation infrastructure, uh, we call it Molecular Ocean Lab, with the aid also of uh, Anya Dipele, who started her PhD with me a few months ago. So, all right, so this is a little bit of myself. This will be the agenda. This is the agenda of what we're going to discuss today. Just uh, an introduction to molecular structure and simulation. Really try to create a space where we, where when I talk, you, you can follow, and I, I, and I will try to define all the termini that I will use uh, along, the the, along the presentation. And I will, after we, we have set this uh, common place to discuss it, to in interact, I will uh, showcase few applications, few recent applications of molecular dynamics to biomedicine, biophysics, which is my native field, let's say. And then also, after that, I will try to discuss also with you someone wants to contribute about possible future application in marine science of biomolecular simulation that have been traditionally overlooked in marine science, especially. All right, so I will start from, uh, with a 
the most beautiful present, uh, picture probably that you will see. The, this is not mine, unfortunately. This is just an in situ cryon electron tomogra uh, tomogra uh, uh, tomography of a cell. And you're observing uh, here uh, that allows to, to, to generate slices of, uh, of cell in situ without basically f near physiological condition. It allows the morphology of membrane and proteins to be uh, highlighted and discerned. Here you see these blue spheres are ribosomes. This is a proteasome. And these are uh, ribosomes that are not attached to the endoplasmatic reticulum. This is a beautiful image that recently obtained. And uh, so this is also another beautiful image that I consider really uh, up to date because it's a representation, a graphical representation, artistic representation from uh, David Gotzel um, of a, how uh, uh, the mRNA, mRNA vaccine would like, uh, looks like. So here there are RNA molecules. This is the nano membrane, and here is our, the, the ethylene glycol uh, chains that allows the, the vaccine to be less uh, immunoresponsive uh, to avoid the, to be attached by the immuno, uh, immune system when you, when you get the jab. So another picture is, uh, again, uh, like uh, this is the Escherichia coli bacterium. You see the, the flagellum. You may recognize the flagellum. A lot of color, a lot of shapes, and each of these shapes correspond to a specific uh, protein, which has a specific shape and function within the E. coli. You can see here the list of the alighted uh, structures. And I continue with this last picture, uh, uh, artistic representation of uh, myoglobin, myoglobin in a whale muscle. So let's say whale. Eh? So this, I'm getting close to the marine environment by looking at whale things. <clears throat> so myoglobin here, which one is myoglobin? Is this little, uh, are these little shapes in red? This is actin, this is myosin, and uh, again, these are really beautiful representations, give us an idea how crowded, how complex is the cellular environment, and also the common reading frame among all the pictures that I've shown you, and that's why I show you, is because all, everything is made of molecules. Everything is made of little structure that interact with each other and exert a function, a certain function. So basically, what I'm trying to convince you here is that we cannot neglect the fact that there are molecules there that are doing things. And if we look at, at the molecular details, we may learn things, new things that we cannot if we look only at the global picture. And one interesting thing, actually, this uh, finding whale muscle uh, myoglobin uh, uh, brought me to, to discover also the first 3D structure of a protein ever that was actually from a whale, from whale myoglobin in, uh, in the 70s. And this has been recently compared to a variety of other proteins. Here is the pig equivalent, and here is the, the whale equivalent, the quail, the quail correspondent. These stars are a positive patch, amino acid, with the beer uh, electrostatic positive charge, uh, like arginine or lysine. And uh, a recent study has shown that this extra charge is really functional for diving mammals, and they use ex these extra charges. So basically, this extra charge is, useful, is on the surface and avoids aggregation at high concentration, which is what is needed for diving mammals to dive for, I don't know, one hour, uh, half an hour. I don't really know the details of how long do they dive. It depends on the mammals. But at they re what they have in their blood, in their muscles, are a lot of high concentration of, uh, of, uh, of myoglobin. And the fact of having this extra charge repel a little bit the proteins. And this allows to reach higher concentration, which turns into higher capability to store oxygen. So that's enabled the, the diving without breathing. And uh, so this is a really, so I, I will stress it again. So here we have a structure, a molecular structure. Here we have a a plethora of other information. So this is the uh, absolute myoglobin net surface charge pre uh, present at the protein surface. And you see whales, uh, beaver, seals, all these diver, they have this kind of feature, which basically increase the solubility of the protein. So there is a direct link between the structure and the behavior of animals, marine animals, for instance. All right, so, so here I'm talking about 3D structure. And uh, the next slide is 
to, just to let you know a little bit, to understand where, where do we get this 3D structure from? So there are mainly three experimental procedures to get the three-dimensional structure of a biomolecule. One is X-ray crystallography, similar to the one that Rosalind Franklin used to uh, describe, uh, to, to observe uh, for the first time the, <clears throat> the double helix of the of DNA. Then there are NMR experiment, nuclear magnetic resonance, and also cryo electron microscopy experiments that uh, are enable a, a wider picture of, uh, of your system, but now are reaching almost uh, uh, resolution of X-ray crystallography. So all this uh, information, people are doing experiments worldwide, and uh, when they get a, a, a new structure or what, yeah, a new structure, they store it in what is called the protein data banks, protein data bank that has nowadays more than 180,000 structures. So it's a huge amount of information, structural information, open to the community. And uh, this huge amount of information has been recently used in machine learning approach, and this opens up like the, another a possibility to obtain a three-dimensional structure, very recent possibility, based on artificial intelligence-based prediction, based on the huge amount of known experimental structure. Uh, these are called AlphaFold from Google and the Rosetta Fold from the Becker Group in Washington. And these are, I would like to highlight that these are really recent paper, uh, recent advances, and they've been uh, commented as a paradigm sh shift in biology. So the fact that we are now able to, pr uh, to predict the three-dimensional structure of a protein with an accuracy never seen before may open new uh, doors that uh, were impossible to open before. So basically, this uh, is opening new application in bio, uh, in a, of biomolecular modeling. All right, so, so we, now we move from a t static three-dimensional structure we get from the experiments to a dynamic three-dimensional structure. Why we, have, why we need a dynamic description? Well, because actually biomolecules are always in constant motion. There is a thermal energy in your system, and they, 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 this gives a, uh, a, a motion, kinetic energy to, to your system, to, the, to the, each atom of your system that moves according to rules of chemistry. And the motion of mo biomolecules is quite important, uh, and I, I will use this kind Ah, well, sorry, yeah, just let me so show you that like this and this, I, this I will show during the presentation, different representation of a protein. This is just a, what is called ball a stick, if, I know, if I'm not wrong, so each atom is a, just a sphere. And this is the ribbon representation where you can appreciate the secondary structure of your protein, uh, alpha helices, beta sheets, and so on and so forth. So this is basically the same things. We are just looking at the same things in a different way with a different uh, uh, computer representation, molecular representation. And why, why it is important, the, the molecular motion, to observe the molecular motion? Well, because it can give us information about uh, mechanism of things, how uh, a protein is functioning. Uh, to highlight, to, to, to better transmit you this information, this, uh, this concept, I put here parallel to this, like this snapshot, temporal snapshot of a galloping horse. So if you look only at one snapshot, you cannot really understand what are the details of the, of the galloping. And even if, let's say, that if an alien comes and never seen this, you say, well, I mean, now we can infer with our knowledge that this might be a horse galloping, but if we never seen these things, we would be, we, we have a hard time to, to understand what is going, what, what is going on here. But if we take temporal snapshot, we can, better understand the details of what is going on. All right, so how do we get to this, to generate this uh, temporal snapshot, we, 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 which we can call trajectory? Uh, and, well, one of the main, uh, most used uh, simulation tools is uh, molecular dynamics. These are molecular dynamics simulation. You define somehow the total energy of your system, based on the bond stretching, torsion, angles, and non-bonded interaction, like uh, electrostatic interaction uh, uh, and uh, Van der Waals interaction. And you have a, a representation of the energy of your system. And what you need next is a, a simple or a complex molecular dynamics algorithm that integrate the equation of motion for you and basically allows you to generate a temporal sequence of the evolution of your system as a function of time, like here. All right, so 
evolution of talking about evolution, not uh, uh, Darwin evolution, but evolution of the field, let's say. And uh, so since the very first molecular dynamic simulation in the uh, 70s, the first biomolecular simulation in the uh, Se uh, well, 60s, the, the simulation, and the 70s, the biomolecular simulation. You can see it took almost uh, what I would like to highlight here in this complex slide. It's like at the beginning, people thought that they could simulate everything and that you could get really any answer for any problem. This was not actually the case because they found many problems in the parameters that the simulation were using, so they had to improve parameters and other things sampling algorithms and so on. But it took, what I would like simply to highlight is that it took more than 40 years for those people that uh, initially started the first molecular simulation to get a Nobel Prize in chemistry. So this Nobel Prize in chemistry is like highlighted because it like, means that like it took 40 years, but then like the scientific community, chemical community specifically, acknowledged the, the usefulness and uh, the contribution of molecular dynamic simulation at different levels of chemical science, biological science, ma material science as well. So this was a, a, a quite good recognition for the field. All right. So I will also highlight that and uh, put lay down the concept that, that molecular process happens on different uh, range of time scales. So depending on what you look at, uh, there are uh, uh, very fast time scales. Uh, like femtoseconds, uh, a little bit slower, the side chain of a protein, rotation of a side chain of a protein usually happens on a nanosecond time scale. Uh, protein structural transition takes a little bit longer, microsecond, and uh, folding uh, or uh, enzyme catalysis, so ligand binding may take up to milliseconds, even more. And what, what is important here is that like, to reach this kind of uh, time scales, we need large computers to simulate systems, and depending on the complexity of your system, this may take, uh, you may simulate uh, five to 100 nanoseconds per day. So that means that like to, to wrap to millisecond, make the calculator and how, how long the simulation uh, uh, is needed, how long, how, how long the simulation is required. Why do we have uh, different time scales? Well, because uh, molecules travels on the energy landscape. So, like we travel here on the surface, we can climb up, up the hill. Molecules do the same, molecular systems do the same. And uh, uh, usually what we observe in a structural experiment is like our molecule just simply populating these states, the more stable energy, energy minimum. And these correspond with the, uh, the structure observed in X-ray crystallography, NMR, and cryo-M. But what happens then, uh, is that if the, so depending on the height of this energy barrier, basically this will influence the time scale of the process that you uh, are observing. So if the energy barrier is very high, the process will be slower. If the energy barrier is little, the process will be faster. And uh, when we do simulation of these systems, because we cannot usually, I mean, because it's difficult to reach microsecond time scale that are relevant for the biological process, for instance, interesting process of ligand binding, uh, uh, protein conformational chain, we basically spend a lot of time sampling uh, intermediate states that are kinetic straps, and our system get literally stuck into these states. And uh, we need to find solution to escape for, the, so the, the, the community have found solution to, to accelerate the sampling and to escape from these uh, uh, minima, uh, why would we need to escape? To accumulate enough statistics to be in a position to make reliable prediction. Because if we always simulate, if we always sample the same state, our prediction is going to have a, a little pre uh, predictability efficiency. So the direction path is just like something that, well, here a definition, like more user-friendly definition of what is a reaction path. But I think this is a quite a self sustainable all right, and, uh, so, and all this simulation can be done with a community developed open source software, and uh, we like to use Plamed. Just uh, that is, uh, that was uh, recently upgraded to a consortium in uh, 2019. All right, so let me just go here. How do we, so how can we escape this minima? And this was a, a first solution that we found back to, 10 years ago, at the end of my PhD, we wanted to estimate the ligand protein affinity 
In drug discovery, this is a typical problem in drug discovery. You have a molecule, you have a, a protein. A, a, what, you really are, you, what you are really interested in is to understand whether your molecule is a good hit, if it can really complement and interact with your protein. And, uh, <clears throat> and to find the solution, we devised a, a kind of uh, intuitive uh, uh, pooling scheme where you attach your ligand to a spring and you move the other on one side and the other hand of the spring is attached to a virtual atom, let's say, that is moving. So the spring uh, extends and then there is a force exerted on your, on, on your ligand that enables and, uh, and force that uh, allow the detachment. And what happened is that by tracking the force required during this unpooling, this, this pooling, uh, we, we, had, we saw that uh, stronger binder had uh, stronger force, of course. I mean, it stays there, you need to pull more. A uh, weaker binder that, you, that didn't require such a big effort, so smaller force. And uh, so this was really quite uh, a new back to those days and got a kind of a, a highlight in the community. And uh, because this was the first time that people were basically uh, physically uh, unbinding a ligand and get the uh, information about the affinity from this unbinding. All right, so, ah, well, I put this asterisk just to remember, to recall me, that all these, uh, inform all these uh, tools then have been exploited, have been used and proved experimentally. Like, so, like, these tools was used, was applied in a real, uh, let's say, drug, or academic uh, drug discovery project, the ligand design project, and uh, could help in the design of effective inhibitor. So they don't just stay on the, on, the, on the computer in silico, but they go at the end in a bench. So let me just also recall this uh, kind of uh, historical uh, picture uh, that I draw with SMARF, like pulling the simulation, because this is how you can transmit. This is the idea that there, you, you go there, you, you make a to-go war with your ligand, and uh, at the end, uh, what, you, uh, what you get is like the, the ligand physically unbinding from the protein. Now I just put the rewind on, your, on, the, on the animation, so it's going back. So then you pull it again, and then you do it several times, and you can accumulate statistics of, on the force required. And actually, a modern uh, variation of this has been done also with, uh, between protein-protein complexes. So you can uh, estimate the affinity not only of a ligand protein complex, but also of a protein-protein complex. All right, so the next step would be, OK, right, cool. Here we, we have a starting configuration of your system, so we, the ligand was already known. What if you don't know the starting geometry of your complex? You are, we are in drug discovery, you, you want to uh, estimate the affinity of your ligand for, to, for, the, for a protein, and uh, the first thing that you need to know is uh, how the ligand is binding and where the ligand is binding. So we try to answer this question, uh, to find the solution to this little equation, to this, with a kind of a... Um, Time-lapse photography inspiration. So in the same way, you can observe by stretching the time, the, the blooming of a flower that usually happens in hours. So you, now we are observing it in a, in a few seconds. In the same way, we apply these things to molecular simulation. And this allows us basically to observe the binding. This is the, the ligand, a binding of independent ligands. This in pink here is where the experiment says that the ligand should bind. I will try to see if it starts again. Well, it doesn't, but all right. So it doesn't start, but it doesn't matter. It's uh, so what you, ah, here, maybe, let's see. So again, so you see one ligand binding there. These are independent ligands. These uh, mosquitoes are independent ligands binding a floating water. These are water, but for sake of clarity, I remove all the water from the system. So there is another binding, another ligand binding, different color, another molecule binding again. So we, 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 we devised this, uh, this uh, let's say, technology, and uh, we applied to many systems, and we found it actually was quite useful in, uh, in uh, predicting uh, 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 the exact uh, experimental binding mode, we call it, uh, for many systems with 90% accuracy. Uh, and the analysis of this trajectory, I will not show it, so does not only uh, give us information about the 3D geometry, but also on affinity, let's say relative affinity, not absolute affinity, and also rel relative residence time. Relative, because if you have different ligands or different version of the same protein, you may discriminate which one is the best in terms of affinity or which, one, which complex stays longer in terms of uh, residence time. All right, so 
moving a little bit forward, leaving the drug discovery fields behind, and uh, can we use the simulation as a general computational microscope? Yeah, the answer is already here. It's a rhetorical question. I say yes, and we can do it to observe, quantify, and manipulate biological process more or less at the same time. I mean, it, yeah, uh, these are like, this is a big statement, but in some cases we can reach this kind of uh, achievement. And I will show you just a, a, a short case uh, about the adenylate cyclase uh, case study. So here is the so the adenylate cyclase is this protein here, big membrane protein with a catalytic uh, domain. And uh, um, what happens is that when an hormone of a drug binds to a GPCR, a G protein coupled, uh, coupled receptor, which are half of the, which are the target of almost half of the drugs in, in commerce, there is a transmission of information. Uh, usually uh, the GPCR, the GPCR is bound to the, these uh, G proteins that they touch from each other, so several subunits, and then the G alpha stimulating G proteins interact with the adenylate cyclase and the triggers the synthesis of a cyclic MP that is like a kind of a overall general uh, modulator of cellular activity. So higher level of, uh, of uh, cyclic MP uh, translate into higher cellular activity, lower level uh, of CKMMP translating to uh, lower uh, basal uh, cellular activity. Because they trigger uh, and activate the cascade of phosphokinase A, see if I'm not wrong. So what I don't show here in this picture is that there is also another protein interacting with, uh, with the adenylate cyclase, which is called GI for G inhibition. And basically it antagonizes the effect of G-alpha so this is a stimulating protein, GI is an inhibiting protein, it binds somewhere else, and basically when GI binds to adenylate cyclase, the synthesis of a, a, a cyclic MP is reduced. So in, this while, so in this way, so the equilibrium between this process uh, uh, allow to, to keep uh, the desired uh, needed uh, value amount of uh, CMP in the cell. All right, so all this, like if you look at the structural data available, we're just translating one single conformation. It was quite uh, weird and strange. Well, well there, there are more than one conformation, more than actual, but they, they resemble really to each other. So we thought that considering all the complexity of the, of the, of the, of the communication pathway uh, um, performed by the let's say, there might be more, more conformation we are missing simply with experiments. Sometimes they, you cannot get the right condition to observe uh, those uh, alternative conformation. So we started uh, using uh, uh, an approach that is based on coevolution, which, which has been, uh, we, we, which the, the community, the scientific community of molecular simulation or in general, the scientific community started to, like, to develop uh, more than 10 years ago. And the basic idea, the underlying idea, is that if you have a, a, a contact in 3D, because of compensatory uh, mutation, so if you mutate something here, you will get induce also a compensatory, compensatory mutation here on the other side. This will reflect into a sequence uh, fingerprint that you can, with co uh, correlation ma uh, methods, you can highlight. So here, for instance, uh, there is a correlation. When there is one mutation on one side, the other also is mutating. And then the interesting thing is that, uh, so like this picture is telling us that if you have simply a, a multiple sequence alignment of your or many proteins analogs, then you can infer what are the 3D concepts in 3D. So and this basic idea, this simple idea has been shown to really be powerful in predicting three-dimensional structure and also alternative three-dimensional structure, alternative with respect to the, those that are already known. So we applied this to our uh, cyclase kinase uh, uh, case study. And so basically here are just the, this is this cyan color uh, dots are just the contacts in the native structure, the, the, the one that you are observing here. So these blue dots are the, those contacts, this coevolutionary pair identified, but they are within the three-dimensional structure of the native structure, so they are not really apporting new information. And what is really new, uh, the, the, the information that are really new are these red dots. They're basically telling us that, uh, like for instance, these residues at some point of the life of this protein, they, come, uh, they interact with each other because there has been, uh, they, were, they observed uh, the compensatory mu mutation between these two residues. So the fact that they observe this uh, correlation probably means that during the function of this protein, these two residues come to a certain way close to each other. All right, so from a, when we apply this in a, so we, when we include the, 
the, the coevolutionary information in a simple dynamic model like this, you see here, the, it's not that I'm, this time I'm not show, it's not that I'm not showing, it's not that I'm not showing the side chain, but the side chain are not present here. So the protein is just represented by the carbon alpha, the alpha carbon. And uh, so what you, are, you can see here is that these two portion of the protein, subdomain, are coming close to each other. You can see, like, if you look at the sphere, like, you see that the, the, the distance is reducing. And this makes completely sense from a functional point of view, because this is the active site of the protein. This is where the ATP binds before being transformed in a cyclic cathode and be transformed into cyclic AMP. So if the active site is closed, the ATP cannot bind. And if it is open, it binds. Right, so, uh, so the, looking at this trajectory, like, and also analyzing it from in this term, so the arrows shows the principal movement, principal component movements of the protein during the coevolutionary driven uh, simulation, you can see that the, if this is the act catalytic site, you see a closure of the end opening. This is the, so I will stop here about this project. So there are other things that uh, we have done in this, in this work. So characterizing the energetics. So going back, back mapping, we call it, going back to a fully atomistic with water around, counter ions and side chain moving around to characterize that in the detailed free energy landscape of this movement. And then also, once we had this, we, 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 we thought that, oh, okay, well, this protein is actually modulated. The activity of this protein is modulated by G alpha and GI. So these two G protein that antagonize to each, each other, one that uh, 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 induce the, the, the formation of a, a cyclic MP and the other that inhibits the generation of a cyclic MP. So we also, uh, perturbed the, 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 the dynamic of the protein with the presence of these, uh, of these uh, two modulators. And uh, we, we came out with a nice story. I mean, we, we got just published, and so I, I will not go into this. Hey, I, I like to prefer diversity. I would like to prefer diversity of things that I'm saying rather than details, because I'm sure the details are not really relevant at this point. And uh, so another thing that we, that we did, well, and uh, uh, is about uh, uh, like using the microscope to observe a uh, nucleic acid, the motion of nucleic acid. In Trieste, we were particularly interested in uh, RNA in nucleic acid. And uh, so this is the double helix of RNA, if I, if I see it correctly. And uh, what the question we were wondering uh, back to those days were very basic. Is uh, how does a base pair open? So if we, if we have a base pair, we are trying to understand how does it happen that it opens up. And uh, if you're thinking at the classical uh, zipper model, so like a zipper, uh, I'm telling you that you should update your, your, your perception of opening of a double helix. This is not what we found. And, uh, uh, and then, well, I will not spoil. And, but then also, well, after trying to, uh, or thinking to have solved this basic question, we, we went a little bit farther and we say, okay, now that we understood a little bit more how the base pair open, can we say that this, there is a connection between the, this mechanism of opening and also the working of helicases? Helicases are the enzymes within the cells that are deputed to open in the double helix. So the evolution of helicases, or let's say the intrinsic property of the double helix may have left a fingerprint in the mechanism of it. Helix open by helicases. So this was the, our basic hypothesis, and we tried to a way to to find to to think about that. Oh well, okay. So let me just say that. So it's not. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not like a zipper, the the opening, but it's a stepwise asymmetric asynchronous process where one of the two base pair unbinds first, and we found a systematic behavior in RNA and DNA. I will not go into the details of what we found, but so basically, if you think at the, uh, the open of a base pair, don't think it like this, but just simply like, well, one first unbind, unstuck, let's say, and then the other follows. So the fact that the other stays there, destabilizes also the possibility of this, unless the one, the, the one that is unbound goes back. So this process is really not frequent. What you observe usually is that the one unbinds, and then you, one leaves, stays there for a little while, and then unbinds again. And uh, at the level of the RNA, we saw that it was happening, of the, well, we just say, uh, the level of RNA, we saw that this was happening always in the same direction. So you know that there is a five prime, a three prime terminal in a, in a double helix. And at the level of RNA, we saw that always the five prime was the first one to, to, to the touch. And then we convinced uh, crazy 
uh, well, or uh, brave uh, experimental scientists to perform experimental tests of how of the link of the link that we thought was existing between the, the mechanism of base pair opening and the mechanism of helicase uh, on the double helix. And, and, and we found that actually what we found, uh, what we uh, modeled, uh, the hypothesis that we generated is a strong bias on the working on helicases and th that we could predict the working on helicases basically. All right, so, well, and this eventually could modulate gene expression, but this is, was kind of a uh, well, step forward. Too long, probably. All right, so wrapping up, just uh, we, we can study flexibility with molecular dynamics, stability, perturbation, mechanical force, and we can study ligand binding, conformational change, and many other things that are uh, relevant uh, for biomedicine. So what about marine science? Maybe some of you somewhere thinking, well, this has nothing to do with what we are doing, what I'm doing in my lab. Okay, I agree, but let, let's see if there is any possibility to apply the methods that I've been showing you so far to something that has, is more close to, to marine science. And uh, so the first project that I will discuss here is a uh, characterization engineer of plastic degrading uh, system from the deep ocean. These are the person, I will always put a band here, a band here uh, uh, saying who were the person that inspired me and motivated me and are collaborating probably with me uh, to develop this project. So I don't need to, I'm jumping just on a, on a boat where like the, the plastic pollution problem is very well known and there are many people working on that here. So but I, I just found interesting also that although a recent paper showed that the, there is no plastic sink uh, missing. So before there was this idea that there were uh, a lot of plastic missing and that they could not detect it and that the, there were ver various hypotheses about where it could be this plastic. Actually, uh, an estimation of the river amount, of the plastic ar uh, uh, amount uh, uh, reaching the, the ocean by the river, a re-estimation of that plastic amount uh, erased basically the plastic sink problem. So there is no plastic sink basically. It's just simply that the, 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 the initial uh, estimates were giving too much importance to the plastic uh, uh, reaching the, the ocean from the, from, uh, from the river. All right, so from uh, then, uh, uh, the recent discovery in 2016 of a bacterium that degradates uh, and that simulates the PET, plastic, and they can basically use uh, as a unique source of carbon and energy PET from uh, bottles, um, re renewed the interest in uh, trying to solve the plastic problem with a kind of an enz enzyme uh, derived, enzyme mediated uh, uh, recycling strategy. So there are many people now trying to uh, work on this and uh, trying to find an enzymatic basic solution so to, to de de degradate pet, pet and use it in a, in a kind of inter uh, industrial bi biotechnological context. So a recent work from the Carlos Duarte lab also having uh, Pep Gasol and uh, Silvia Chinas as co-author show that in the global ocean, so analyzing the Tara Ocean and the Malaspina uh, gene catalogs show, has shown and found that there are PETAs around the ocean at different depth also. And uh, they identified uh, at least 20 ocean PTAs. They may have uh, a, an efficiency in catalyzing, in degradating uh, the PET as much as the, the one from the uh, terrestrial bacterium that was uh, isolated in a, a plastic uh, recycling uh, setup in Japan. So these open up for questions like, can we use this uh, PET or also this one PTAs enzyme as a starting point for biotechnological or industrial application? Well, this is uh, the idea. And uh, if some of you are thinking that maybe how can we compete or outcompete uh, nature, I, I would just say that, uh, or billions of years of evolution, I would say that probably we're not here in competition, in competition with, with, with nature, but we, what the, 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 the setting of a bacterium where a bacterium evolved is different from the one that is used in an industrial setting, for instance. So we need to uh, get the, 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 the natural enzyme and then adapt it to the industrial uh, uh, condition that are used to, for instance, plastic recycling. For instance, one of the examples, the typical example is that industrial setting requires higher temperature to reach the glass transition uh, uh, of, pla of PET at 70 degrees. So like these, these enzymes works at room temperature. If you want to make it work also at a room, uh, higher temperature, you need to find a way to stabilize it. Because otherwise, anyway, at room temperature is really slow. It cannot really be used in a, in a kind of industrial way, in industrial settings. All right, so 
to do all this biotechnological application to try to find a solution to that, uh, what is really important, at least from uh, uh, a molecular perspective, is to understand how the substrate interacts with enzymes. There was a, this paper in 2019 that proposed that this kind of, so this is the PTAs, this blue and uh, white and red, this is the surface of the PTAs of the enzyme, and this is the, the a, a four units PET binding, and well, they, they proposed their, their way. Uh, they used actually static, uh, computation, they didn't in include the dynamics here. So they, 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 they made a quite relatively, let's say, simple calculation to try, based on the experimental structure anyway that they had. A few months later, these, uh, these some conclusions were questioned in another, uh, in a matter arising in, in natural chemistry as well. So what the, these authors were uh, questioning was basically the PET geometry of subunits. They didn't like uh, this uh, straight uh, bond here. And also the, this mechanism implies that four subunits binds at the same way, at the, simultaneously. And this is kind of unlikely if you think about that a little bit. So we try to find a, we, can, we say, okay, then maybe as a conflict resolution strategy, we may use a molecular simulation to find a solution to this possible problem. And this is what we did. So we took the PETAs and uh, we simulated a, a four unit PET in proximity of the active site, or what is known as an active site, and then uh, this is what, he, what we observe. This is a magnification of what we observe. So, well, you can see that there is no really need. So, so, so this portion, this red sphere, is the, is the catalytic residues of PET, PETAs, that needs to interact with the carbon here that I show you here better. So this is, a required, is a required to trigger the catalytic reactivity of this enzyme, this proximity. And, uh, uh, what we can do is basically observe this distance as a function of time for a long simulation. So here you can see that the system swap between a, a high distance, 0.8, so there is no catalytic reactivity there possible. The, 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 the enzyme cannot reach the substrate. And there is a here, uh, these uh, little spots here where the, actually there is a, a catalytic, uh, a, a distance of about three that is uh, what allow the enzyme, this uh, serine to attach the, the reactive center of the substrate. So from here, from this kind of plot, we can uh, estimate a, a, an energy landscape, an energy profile, which is here, and say, okay, if the minimum is observed in this reactivity zone, then our enzyme can actually, or, or probably, uh, uh, catalyze PET depolyrimidization. So like now that we have this tool, let's say that this is a tool or matrix in our hands, if we, have a, if we modify the enzyme in a way that then the profile looks like this, we can say, okay, well, we are getting an answer affinity because we are pushing the system always closer to this distance to be really the one that is required to, for the enzyme to, to cut the, the polymer. But if we get another uh, enzyme, for instance, that give us a, this kind of profile, we say, oh, wow, this is not really gonna work in terms of uh, efficiency, working, uh, enzymatic efficiency. And so we can use this kind of approach to characterize the engineered PET, PET, PETases, we will use it to, let's say, reproduce what is already known about PETase activity, and also uh, to predict new PETase activity efficiency, and also to study the PETases from the ocean, from the deep ocean. This is called, like this uh, complex is called, well, it's okay, I will, I mean, there are other factors, of course, that may uh, affect the, the efficiency of the enzyme, but for the moment we are just focusing on this one, which is called Michaelis complex. All right, so another possible application of molecular simulation is to, into uh, deducing the thermal stability or recovering the thermal stability of a protein. From a sequence only, you cannot get the thermal stability accurately. Well, you cannot, well, there are, there are tools that are trying to predict it, but it usually is not possible. And again, I told you that like the, uh, in industrial settings, uh, we're interested in having a thermostable PTAs, so this uh, uh, kind of simulation, this is a, a, a melting profile uh, uh, produced from simulation. Uh, basically, here you see that there is a protein that has a lower stability because it melts, let's say, at 400 something, and this other has melts at uh, above 500. And this has higher stability. And uh, so this could guide uh, the, the production of thermostable enzymes for industrial settings. And also, one thing that came out talking with Ramir is that they found sometimes adaptation of, of uh, 
for instance, in Caribbean uh, environment, the microorganisms living in Caribbean, they have they bear a different mutation. Sometimes uh, one can speculate they might be induced by, from the temperature. With this kind of simulation, you might observe, uh, you might give an explanation, you might check maybe whether or not uh, that mutation really affect or, well, or possibly affect the, the, the thermal stability of your system. So track the thermal adaptation of your system, of your microorganism. And uh, how do we do that? Well, these are just the details. So each one of these dots represents a, a, a simulation run at different temperature. And we look at the fluctuation, so the, 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 the different temperature, actually there are replica of the same steam system traveling at different temperature, they com can communicate to each other, so that at the end of the day, the thermodynamic ensemble to correspond to each temperature is exact. And, uh, and basically we can, uh, we can reconstruct this kind of profiles. So we having diff adding different replica at different temperature. All right, so, one other application of structural modeling now is not where here I, I didn't use or we, we are not planning for the moment to use any molecular simulation, but just the structural uh, modeling is uh, uh, so for the characterization of hypothetical proteins for transcriptomics, uh, for instance, from transcriptomics, one of the first things that I discussed with Ramon was, uh, hey, I have a, during this uh, endocytosis bacterivorous growth, uh, there is a, a, a protein that is always expressed, overexpressed, and we don't know what it is. Can you tell us what it is? I say, well, I'm not sure I can tell you what it is, but I will try to do what it is. And actually, this is not, it's also something, well, I will, I will say that later. And uh, um, so the approach that we're using, so we took the sequence of this, we ran it through uh, AlphaFold, let's say, so it's the best predictive, predictive strategy structure predictive model that we have so far, and uh, we got this... Uh, so basically, the, the, all these, the, only the blue parts is the one that has a high confidence about the prediction. So what I'm saying is that we can only use this portion of the protein. And for this portion of the protein, we can be relatively confident that that could be the fold assumed by that sequence. And we don't know all the rest. And what we do now, what we think we may do, is to do a structural comparison with all the folds, folded protein, 180,000 protein folded. And see whether there is a match at the structural level, if they superimpose somehow. And then if they superimpose, try to see, okay, which protein was that one? Oh, maybe. Let's consider uh, if it is the case, and let's consider all these possible hits that we found from the structural superposition of my hit with what is already known. And, uh, and the same problem, the same questions came out with a discussion, recent discussion with Lucia, and so we are addressing uh, uh, um, we are using, we will be using the same approach also to, to, to address uh, uh, questions in the winding response in, spon in, uh, uh, in, in sponges. It is also relevant because it seems to be related to cancer response in humans. So it might be also something interesting also coming out, like additional levels that go, can go back to my native background in, uh, in drug discovery. All right, so, well, well, this is probably the last of the I will go relatively fast. Using a carboxyl X-rays is something that uh, Montessori told me she is trying to see if she, one can use it as a, a biomarker to see whether or not uh, 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 xenobiotics are uh, affecting uh, marine spaces. So what is important is that any interaction with, of xenobiotic with carboxyl x should be looked at as a concern. And the carbo why? Because carboxyl esterases are enzymes, uh, the detoxifying enzymes. So, I, if, I, if I interpreted correctly my recent discussion with Monse, it's like, can we know whether the, these compounds interact or not with marine species? I say, well, let's see if we can do that. Uh, first of all, let's do it, try to do it for something that is known. So the human uh, carboxyl esterase is really uh, well characterized. This is tamoxifen, anti-cancer drug. And we know that it interacts uh, like this from uh, experimental X-ray uh, diffraction data. We run uh, my, our simulation, our type of simulation. Uh, the, 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 the ligand is explored a little bit and then uh, spontaneously goes into the active site reproducing the, 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 the binding mode observed experiment. So this uh, gives us a little bit of hope that we can actually, well, after modeling the dolphin, for instance, of turtle protein, that are difficult to obtain experimentally, actually in a purified way, then uh, we, could, we could 
try to simulate and see whether these uh, uh, additives or uh, drugs may interact or not in the way in which way they may interact and we may even be able to rank the interaction which one is the best interacting one all right so this is the very last slide about uh, like uh, very last I'm moving away from uh, bio things and I'm just after discussion very initial discussion with uh, Jose Luis Jose Luis we had a, a I, I thought that we may uh, model this kind of uh, behavior. So a flow direction, a flow generation when a hydrogel uh, nanotunnel is uh, emerged in water. So produced by Pollack. This is a kind of a controversial author. So, well, let's try to see if one day I would be able to model these kind of systems also. And uh, we will be able to model this kind of system. All right, so summary and take home messages. Biomolecular simulation allow to observe, quantify, and manipulate biological process. I hope I somehow convinced you that this is possible. Of course, you need to find the right, the, the, the good question also that you would like to answer. Then uh, uh, what we will be trying to do is to push the applicability of structure modeling and biomolecular simulation in marine science in these years. And all this based on the basic idea that uh, molecules are unifying entity among different disciplines who are made of molecules. So, I mean, if you look at the right, uh, uh, the, uh, some question might be like, if you look at the molecular level, you may find a solution for problem coming from different disciplines. And uh, well, this is a, a reminder from our preferred uh, molecular dynamics engine. And uh, like, of course, theoretical chemistry, all theoretical methods have been always important, of course, to people working in that field. I hope we can expand, we can expand this, uh, this statement. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the very last slide. I, well, I thank everybody, Ramon, all the group of Ramon, actually all the people, all the people that have been interacting with me here at ICM since I arrived, those that will interact with me perhaps after looking, after uh, listening to this uh, uh, little uh, lecture, and also all people in my previous lab and previous collaborators, all the resources, Severo Choa coordination team, doing an excellent job in networking and directing me to people in, at the Institute. And I thank you everybody for your attention. And if you have questions, I will be happy to try to answer. Thank you. <laughs>